morning. So why don't we now stand for our opening prayer. Let's fold our hands and pray from our hearts. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and Paramahansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Divine Mother, bless me that as I strive to serve my fellow man, I may work out my own salvation and open a channel for thy love to flow to me. Om. Peace. Amen. Please be seated. So we'll begin the service with a short meditation. It's not terribly comfortable meditating with a mask on. So we'll begin with a devotional reading. And then instead of chanting as a group, our organ player will lead us. He'll play a chant, and you're welcome to sing along mentally, silently. As it take, It's the beginning of the interiorization process, chanting. It helps us arouse our devotion, which fuels our efforts in meditation to keep the mind on God, on the techniques. And so if you're new and you have no techniques, the two fundamentals that you need to know are proper posture, and that the goal was expressed by Patanjali thousands of years ago, and that is to hold the spine erect for the duration of the meditation without tension or stress. And so here we're all sitting in chairs, so we'll sit with the back ideally away from the back of the chair, and then then it's just that good posture, chins up parallel to the ground, shoulders back, chest out, and then hands at or near the junction of the thigh and the abdomen. And then the other fundamental is the position of the eyes. We want to gently lift the gaze to the level of the spiritual eye, the level, the point between the eyebrows. And the mental gaze is at one point. The physical gaze, again, is just gently lifted. We're not necessarily crossing the eyes and creating all that tension and stress, which would be a distraction from meditation. So it's that gentle lifting of the gaze and then holding the gaze there for the duration of the meditation. And if you're new, after whatever, 20 minutes or so, they could, your muscles in the eyes can get tired, but as you continue to practice in just a week or two, you'll have developed those muscles, and it'll be easy to hold the gaze uplifted throughout a meditation. But that's important because eyes uplifted correspond to spiritual perception. Eyes straight ahead correspond to activity. Material consciousness, eyes down correspond to subconsciousness or sleep. So it's important to keep those eyes gently uplifted. And then if, again, if you have no technique, just take some devotional thought. It could be something uh, from the chant lyrics, but it could be something, I love you, Lord. If you're feeling great devotion, great love, express that. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. If you're not feeling the love, it could be, Lord, fill my heart with thy love. Fill my heart with thy love. Keep repeating it silently, mentally, as often as mind wanders, bring it back to that thought. And as you do that, the breath starts to slow down, the mind starts to slow down, the distracting thoughts start to calm down, and we begin to feel greater peace within. And there's no end to that peace, and it's on that altar of peace that Divine Mother will be revealed to us in totality. So let us now sit in meditation posture. I'd like to share these words of Paramahansaji. And then Victor will lead us in a silent chant on the organ. This is titled, Teach Me to Seek Thee. And Paramahansaji wrote, O Spirit, teach me to aspire each day to the best in everything. 
Teach me to crave the supreme lasting joy of thy presence in preference to passing sense pleasures. Teach me to perform all my duties to please only thee. Teach me to think of thee until thou dost become my only thought. Teach me to call thee until thou breakest thy vow of silence. Teach me to seek thee until I find thy hiding place. Teach me to beat the drum of my craving until thou dost come into the temple of my heart. Teach me to exude fragrant devotion until it lures thee into my soul garden. Teach me to behold the spreading radiance of thine infinite presence. Teach me to dig with the pickaxe of my peace deeper and deeper into the soil of silence until the water of thy presence gushes forth and I am bathed in thy bliss. Teach me to look for thee in myself until I realize that it is thou who hast become I. Let us now mentally chant.
topic for this morning's service is service, the power of love in action. And it's a beautiful title and topic, but it's a vital topic because the vast amount of our life is spent in activity, not even in meditation, in activity. And by learning the principles of spiritual service, selfless service, we can learn to spiritualize every aspect of our life. There's no aspect of our lives that needs to be separated from our search for God. And service is a powerful accelerator or catalyst to our spiritual progress, to our spiritual evolution. And that's because it is founded, it is rooted in unselfishness. It is rooted in love, divine love. And Paramahansa Ji said, divine love manifests as action. And there was no shortage of material to find today to support these principles. It was uh, St. Uh, Thomas Akempis who once said, whoever loves much, does much. And I've seen it expressed this way in a book called The Razor's Edge. The author wrote, in this is the secret of self-realization, love experienced, then love expressed. Selfless service is intelligent love in action. And this is the essential meaning of right action. And this message of service being divine love in action is echoed in today's scriptural passages from the Bible and from the Bhagavad Gita. The Bible passage is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, where Christ said, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit inherit." the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, When saw we thee hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of my brethren, ye have done it to me. And in the Gita, Lord Krishna said to Arjuna, O Arjuna, no compelling duty have I to perform. There is not that I have not acquired, nor is there anything that I have to gain in the three worlds. Yet I am consciously present in the performance of all actions. And in commenting, Paramahansa said, Krishna was emphasizing, quote, that even as I am non-attached to the cosmos, and yet I am present in every action, so each of my divine offspring must do some work to help my deluded creation and its mortals come back home to me." And then Paramatsuji followed. He said, life should be chiefly service. When in service you forget the little self, you will feel the big self of spirit. Think of the happiness of your fellow beings first, and your own happiness will be included in it. That's the divine law of happiness. Think of others first. Think of the happiness of others first. Without even seeking it, the cup of your own happiness will be filled. And he concluded his commentary on the Gita passage by saying, if your work in life is humble, do not apologize for it. Be proud because you are fulfilling the duty given you by the Father. He needs you in your particular place. All people cannot play the same role. So long as you work to please God, all cosmic forces will harmoniously assist you. And that last point is so important to what we were talking about, learning to spiritualize every aspect of our life, every minute of our lives. Because it's important to remember that to transmute all work into soul-liberating service, 
dedicated to God, no matter what the outward role is, if, again, if we offer it, offer the fruits of our actions, make it an offering of love to God, then that transmutes even the most insignificant, seemingly, seemingly insignificant action into soul-liberating service. And it was Martin Luther King. He once said, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted, as Beethoven composed music, as Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. No matter what the outward role, again, if done to the best of our ability, as an offering of love to God, it transforms it and makes it great in the eyes of God. Because Guruji emphasized the same exact principle. He said, work of any kind, if done with the right spirit, gives you victory over yourself. You may clean bathrooms, but if you do it with the thought of serving and helping people, you are showing the right spirit of a man of God. The attitude with which you work is what counts. God is watching our hearts, our motives. So we must make our passion, our yearning for God, our love for God, make our passion our profession, and that will transmute any action into an offering of love to God, regardless of the outward role. And if we take this counsel to heart, regardless of whether we're serving in a temple or an ashram, or in a corporation or profit-driven business, wherever, if we perform it again to the best of our ability as an offering of love to God, then we have successfully transmuted work into soul-liberating service. And it seems so easy to remember, and yet it's so hard, isn't it, day to day? And that's because Maya, Satan, cosmic conscious force whose sole purpose is to keep us enmeshed in this delusion, in creation, is always striving to drive a wedge between us and truth, us and God, to drive us away from the light of God into the darkness and confusion and ignorance of these principles. So we have to make that effort every day to remember, learn, and apply these truths because they, they can fade away if we're not diligent unless we learn it now, unless we take to heart what is conveyed in the Bible passage day, in the Gita, what Paramahansaji is telling us, and so forth, we will find out at the end of life, and it won't be as pleasant. It's much less painful to learn it now, in life, because these near-death experiences that our peers have had, many of you are aware of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, she was famous, most famous, for writing a book on the five stages of grief. And yet, later on, she came out with a book, The Wheel of Life, a memoir of living and dying, because probably in the 50s and 60s, she was like a clinical psychologist, a counselor in a terminal wing of a hospital, basically to all those in hospice care. And she interviewed and counseled hundreds of people through that time, and a lot of them, hundreds, started sharing with her near-death experiences they had. She didn't publish it until after the early 70s when a Dr. Raymond Moody was a pioneer and had a very groundbreaking book, Life After Life, which kind of made sharing these near-death experiences mainstream. But in that book, she shared, she learned from all these interviews and these people sharing their near-death experiences with her, she said there were four distinct phases, the first being floating out of their bodies. And if you've ever studied them, somebody may pass away on an operating table and what they, they float up and they're looking down. They don't necessarily even identify with that body on the table because they feel more alive than ever. But that experience, floating out of the body, is one distinct phase. And then connected to that, the second phase is when leaving the physical body and becoming aware of that astral body, they may not call it an astral body, that they are, they feel more alive than they've ever felt before, and they're greeted by entities, spiritual guides, guardian angels, and even deceased loved ones to help them in this transition from the physical to this higher realm. 
And then a third distinct phase is that traveling through the tunnel. And Guruji explains what that is. That's the soul passing up through the spine and out the spiritual eye. That's the tunnel to the light of the spiritual eye. They always talk about the light at the end of the tunnel. That's the light of the spiritual eye. But the fourth distinct phase is the life review. And based on all her interviews with these people who've had these experiences, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote this. She said, in this phase of the life review, people reported being in the presence of the highest source. Some called it God. Others reported simply knowing that they were surrounded by every bit of knowledge there was, past, present, and future. It was non-judgmental, this higher source, God, this divine consciousness. It was non-judgmental and loving. In this state, people went through a life review, a process in which they confronted the totality of their lives. They went over every action, word, and thought of their lives. They were made to understand the reasons for every decision, thought, and action they had in life. They saw how their actions affected other people, including strangers. They saw what their lives could have been like, the potential they had. They were shown that everybody, everybody's life is intertwined, that every thought and action has a kind of ripple effect on every other living thing on the planet. Welcome to the wonderful world of oneness. <laughs> but she goes on, she says, the greatest gift God gave man was free choice, something the saints Guruji also emphasized. But she said, but that requires responsibility, the responsibility to make the right, the best, the most thoughtful, respectful choices, choices that benefit the world, choices that improve mankind. In this phase, people reported being asked, what service have you rendered? It was the hardest question to answer. It demanded that people confront whether or not they had made the highest choices in life. They found out whether or not they learned the lessons they were supposed to learn, the ultimate being unconditional love. And we have the blessing to learn that lesson now, not wait for a life near-death experience or the end of life. And again, we learn it now when we have that life review. It will bring us great joy and we'll see the tremendous progress we made. Again, if, we, if our love manifests as unselfish action. And we realize through their experience the saints have told us too. Again, we were talking about it earlier. It doesn't matter so much what you do, but how you do it, the motive, the spirit with which you serve and, and act. But if we act for the, if we work for the sake of work alone, then certainly in a life review, we'll see that the results of that work are almost, they're useless. They have little value. Even if outwardly that work resulted in great accomplishments in the material world, a big building, a successful corporation, at that point we'll realize it is of little value. And even if we performed our actions selfishly, then it's not only of little value, it's of less than that. It's binding the soul to this plane. But any action performed, again, as a manifestation of love, as a service performed to God, with God, in the presence of God, for God, is of untold value, even if outwardly it was some seemingly mundane, trivial, or insignificant action. It's of greatest value when performed with that right attitude, with that loving spirit. So it's this consciousness, this attitude of carefully and constantly cultivating the right spirit of activity, right spirit of service, day after day, month after month, year after year, that will lead to a very uplifting life review at the end of life. And we'll see the tremendous progress we made through those simple actions, but performed with great love. But if we, don't, if we aren't diligent in making, remembering that and applying it every day, again, Maya, Satan, is a con conscious force. And it's, he's good at what he does, always driving a wedge between us and God, us and truth, driving us away from the light, 
toward selfishness. It was St. Teresa of Lisieux, the little flower. She once wrote, we must realize that all our works count for nothing in themselves. That is not to say that good works are not to be done. We must perform them continually. But do them because we love God, not because we think they have intrinsic value. God cares nothing for the deed itself, but he cares greatly about the most trivial act if it is done to please God, to show that we love him. And Mother Teresa of Calcutta said basically the exact same thing. She said, we can do no great things, only small things with great love. She said, God does not mind how much we do. What affects him is how much love we put into the work. And she shared a beautiful story. They were having a sugar shortage in Calcutta, and they couldn't get any sugar for her orphanage and the children in the orphanage in Calcutta. And there was one little four-year-old boy, Hindu boy, lived nearby, and he would come to the orphanage many times a week to play with the other children, and he heard about this. And so he went home, and he announced to his parents that... I shall eat no sugar for three days. I want to give mine to Mother Teresa. <laughs> and in sharing this, Mother Teresa said, how much sugar can a four-year-old eat in three days? You know, a small cup. But three days later, he marched into the orphanage and said to her, I have gone three days without sugar. This is for your children. A small cup of sugar. But she said a small action, but he had truly acted with great love. Love transforms things and makes them great. Love transforms things and makes them great. And Sri Dharamada, our late president, said, everything we do, every duty or service we perform can be an act of devotion to God if done with the right attitude. And if done with the right attitude, it propels us on our spiritual evolution, our journey of spiritual evolution. So again, if we can cultivate this attitude to perform every action to God, with God, for God, in the presence of God, then we are transmuting work into selfless service, into soul-liberating service, and such service touches the heart of God and hastens our spiritual evolution. Someone once rashly remarked to Mother Teresa that they wouldn't help or touch a leper for a thousand pounds, you know, for a million dollars. Without hesitation, Mother Teresa says, neither would I, but I would willingly tend him for the love of God. Love transforms things and makes them great. Such is the transforming power of love. It can transform any seemingly mundane or trivial duty, action, and make it great. And we said, service is very purifying, very expansive when performed with that right attitude. And when we hear the saints or avatars or even our peers or even from our own experiences of a higher state of consciousness, when they're at those higher states are being described, we hear words like, Oneness, unity, expansion, not separation, division, limitation. And service very definitely moves us closer to those higher states, to that unity, to that oneness, to union with God, union with spirit. It was Albert Einstein, he once wrote, a human being is a part of the whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences, him, experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole nature in its beauty. 
Our task is to widen our circle of love, compassion, to embrace all living creatures, all creation. And we won't experience any true or lasting happiness or peace on this earth until we commit to this task. And we have experienced ourselves that how rewarding it is and how unrewarding we can if we act selfishly, we can acquire the greatest wealth, luxuries, possessions, and so forth, and it doesn't make us happy. There was a, a man, his name's Kenneth Baring, and he was a, had hundreds of millions of dollars. At one point, he owned the professional football team, the Seattle Seahawks, and he experienced this, and he wrote, he said, I worked hard all my life to become prosperous. I owned houses, cars, a private jet, even a professional football team. But I lacked purpose, something you achieve by giving your heart, time, and money to provide a better life for another without seeking anything in return. He tapped into this law of happiness, and he lived out the rest of his life as a very happy man. And when he realized this, he founded something called the Wheelchair Foundation. And the mission statement was to provide, to deliver a wheelchair chair to every child, teen, and adult in the world who needs one. And in the first 10 years, they distributed 750,000 wheelchairs to recipients in 153 countries. And especially in those poor countries, without that wheelchair, they're trapped. And they're either bedridden or they're ridden, they restricted to their homes. That wheelchair is freedom. They can get out and work and so forth. It was such a big deal. And again, we can learn. Wisdom is learning through the experiences of others, Guruji said. And we can learn through our peers who had these near-death experiences. And it was Dr. Raymond Moody. Again, he must have interviewed tens of thousands of people who've had these near-death experiences. And once he was interviewing a little girl, and I don't know how, but she had clinically died then been resuscitated. And he was asking her about it, and she said she learned through that near-death experience that she had a, a new life. And she explained that in Sunday school, they'd always been taught about heaven, but she never believed it. <laughs> and, but now she said, I'm not afraid to die anymore because I kind of know a little more about it now. <laughs> but he asked her how she was different because of that near-death experience. And as a little girl, and he, he said she paused and was silent for a long time. And then she said, it's nice to be nice. You know, out of the mouths of children. This is the principle we're talking about. It's nice to be nice. Make those right choices that will help uplift mankind, that will help others, make others happy. And in the process, we'll find a cup of our own happiness being filled and then on the other side, we'll look and we'll see the tremendous spiritual progress, evolution we made through those simple acts, unselfish acts, loving acts. He wrote a foreword to somebody's book on near-death experiences, and he kind of summarized what he had learned through all those years interviewing people studying near-death experiences, and he said, near-death experiences teaches us that our own individual lives are important and filled with meaning. Again, we could, sometimes they can seem so superficial and trivial, but again, if we take everything and then act with love, it makes it great. Our lives are filled with meaning. Our lives are important every step of the way. And he said, I am struck again and again that those who have entered into God's light and returned do so with a simple and beautiful message. So he's summarizing the message he learned through all those years of studying and interviewing people. And the message is, love is supreme. Love must govern. We are all sent here to live life fully, to live it abundantly, to find joy in our own creation, to experience both failure and success, to use free will to expand and magnify our lives. We are to love one another. You are to be kind to be tolerant, to give generous service. We are to love one another. We are to be kind, to be tolerant, to give generous service.
This is at the core of what all our peers have learned through these experiences. And he summarized what that teaches us, and he said, the lesson of this is, if we are kind, we will have joy. That's what he's found. If we are kind, we will have joy. It's nice to be nice, and we will have joy if we are nice. (laughs) And again, love manifests as action. It's got to find outward expression. And we can find great We find great progress, as we said, in service, but we can find great healing. I think it's, there's a story of a young woman. Her name was Caroline Ognowski. And it's appropriate, yesterday was the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and her father was the pilot in the very first plane that was hijacked and flown in to the World Trade Center. And so that was 2001. In fall of 2005, she was an 18-year-old, entering her first year of college at Boston College. And so on a Thursday, she moved into the dorms, spent a couple nights with her new roommate. But that first Saturday was the fourth anniversary of 9-11. And after that happened, she lost her father, of course. Her family was interviewed for publication articles and news articles on television and so forth. And she, as a result, got kind of a label the pilot's daughter, the 9-11 girl. And you can imagine a teenager has a hard enough time finding themselves. And with that label, it made it even more difficult. And she said it was like a wall, a 9-11 wall, that she was on the inside and everybody else was on the outside. She was like a zoo animal. Their intentions were good. She was on the receiving end of their sympathy, but it, it just made her, it even made it harder to find herself to find out how to, you know, process the grief and how to honor her father. So on that first Saturday, she's in the dorms. She hadn't talked to her new roommate about who her father was. She she wanted to get to know her better and let her her roommate get to know her better. And so she didn't, again, share any of those details. And so on that first Saturday, she just simply told her roommate that uh, I'm going to do something with my family. And so she went, attended a service that was held in Boston every year, and they would have probably been seated right up front, and it was televised. And she noticed that there were fewer people every year. And it it kind of hurt, because she wanted to find some way, again, to honor her father, to help people so people didn't forget. But she didn't know how. Again, she's just a teenager dealing with all this grief. And... Four years had passed. She was still looking for her own identity, still trying to figure out how can I honor my father and get past the sadness that 9-11 brought into her life uh, every day of her life. And so she attended the service. She went home, and she was glad her roommate wasn't there, and she plopped down on the bed, was staring at the ceiling, ceiling, again, just thinking of ways to, how can I honor my father? And she thought about her father. He was a pilot. He had flown missions in the Vietnam War, but his first love was farming. They lived on a 150-acre farm in Massachusetts. And beyond that, his passion was helping others. One thing he had done was volunteer to serve as a mentor to immigrant farmers from the South, from Southeast Asia, to get a new start in their new home in the United States. This is what he loved to do is help others. And she was lost in thought, and her roommate came in, and, you know, how was that thing with your family today? And she says, oh, it was fine. How was your day? And her roommate said, oh, it's, it's been good. But her mind was clearly somewhere else, and, you know, not pretty quickly, she said, you know, I was watching television this morning, and I saw you at the memorial service. Was your dad the pilot on Flight 11? And of course he was. And she said, I wish I'd known. And Carolyn answered her and said, you know, I, it's just a hard thing to talk about. I was really hoping to get to know you better first, and I wanted you to get to know me so she wouldn't be the 9-11 girl, the pilot's daughter. And her roommate said, I understand. It was just kind of shocking to see my roommate on TV. But then she said, listen, the reason I came back to the room is a group of us are collecting money for Hurricane Katrina victims 
Would you like to help? And Caroline, that daughter, thought it's help, helping others. That's what dad was all about. What better way to honor him today? She said, yes, you don't know how great that sounds. So she got together with a group of students that had a short orientation, and they dispersed to collect money for the victims of Hurricane Katrina. And they didn't create, you know, collect great amounts, but they collected a few hundred dollars. And they, afterwards, she headed back across campus and was reflecting on the day's events, attending the service and thinking about how to honor her dad, and then serving. And she, having served that afternoon, she's walking back to her room, and she said, I, I was tingling. I had a tingling feeling. And it, she realized for years she'd been on the receiving end of others' sympathies, and she had never, ever been able to shake her sadness of 9-11. But now she was doing something for someone else, helping other people hurt by tragedy. And she said, you know, she realized, I feel good. She said to herself, no, I feel incredible. <laughs> and she realized then and there that the best way to honor her father was to help others. And she, in that moment, she finally found peace. And she found herself through service. She realized she dedicated herself, got a master's in counseling psychology in her, and dedicated her career to helping children working through trauma. But it all turned around for her on that day she started serving. There is great healing to be found in service. As Albert Schweitzer was giving a commemoration, a com commencement service, commencement address, and at some point in his talk he said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know, the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. That's that principle of happiness. Seek to make others happy, and the cup of our own happiness will be filled. And that's why Guruji, again, in his commentary in the Gita, said, life should be chiefly service. When in service you forget the little self, you will feel the big self of spirit soul. So there is great joy to be found in service. There is great peace of mind to be found in service. There is greatness found in service. And that's why it said those footprints in the sand of times were made by work boots. <laughs> and the beautiful thing about service is that everybody can be great. In service. We may not be the greatest lover of God. We're striving. We may not be the greatest meditator. <laughs> We're striving. But we can all be the greatest lover of God as manifested through service. Because we don't all bring the karma to be a great world leader or diplomat or business person or scholar or so forth. But we all have the capacity for greatness through service. Martin Luther King, again, he said, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. We only need that heart full of grace, a soul generated by love, a soul motivated and inspired by love is all that's needed to be great in the arena of service. So Guruji said, it is not necessary to know and love all human beings and other creatures personally and intimately. All you need to do is to be ready at all times to shed the light of friendly service over all living creatures whom you happen to meet. This attitude requires constant mental effort and preparedness, in other words, unselfishness. So again, he emphasizes, we've got to diligent every day strive to keep this principle uppermost in our consciousness, because again, there's forces working to erode it. But all we need to, be, to do is to be ready at all times to shed the light of friendly service upon those who cross our path. And I read a great story. A woman, she shared a story about her 
sister who was a travel agent. This had to be at least 30 years ago because it was before uh, websites and search engines and uh, travel websites and so forth. So back then, a travel agent, on her vacations, she always went to some new location trying to look out, find some new um, attraction so she could share with her clients, she could recommend to her clients. And so she had heard about this um, beautiful hotel on a mountaintop on the Greek island of Akaria. So on her vacation, she went there, flew to Greece, took the boat to Akaria, rented a moped, and again, it's before Google Maps, <laughs> before Waze, and so she's searching all over the island for this hotel on this mountaintop. She searches all morning, no luck. So she pulls over to a side rack cafe, gets off her moped, sits down at a table on the front porch and orders a coffee. She's pouring over her maps, regrouping, She's ready to go and start a search again, and she asks the proprietor for her bill. And he says, oh, no, no, there's no charge. And she goes, no, no, that's very kind of you, but I insist you let me pay. And the man says, ma'am, there is no charge for the coffee because this is my home. <laughs> It wasn't a sidewalk cafe. <laughs> It was his front porch. <laughs> But she asked for a coffee, and he brought her a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That man was ready to shed the light of friendly service <laughs> on anybody who crossed his path, and my guess is he was a very happy man. So let us now meditate for a few minutes, and then we'll pray for others. So let's just meditate and let us pray for others, for all those in need of healing of the body, mind, and soul. And let us pray for world peace, harmony, and brotherhood. Let us all now stand and close with a prayer. Let us pray together, Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Great Gurus, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Divine Mother, Uplift our consciousness that we may feel thy presence within us, around us, everywhere. Fill our hearts with thy love and help us to share that love with all who cross our path. Om Shanti Shanti, 
Amen.